So I was reading in prepping this message about a, a man who was an atheist. Did not believe in God at all. And he wrote this. He said, a big problem for belief in the Christian God is the existence of people who sincerely do not believe in the Christian God. So this atheist is saying, one of the problems I have with Christians and their Christian God is there are a lot of people who sincerely don't believe in God. Right? That's true. A lot of people sincerely don't believe in God. About 10% of our population. And then he said this, could God really deny salvation to someone just because they're unconvinced by the historical basis for the resurrection? Would God do that? So I sincerely don't believe in that. God's going to condemn me? He said, if Christianity claims that sincere disbelief is enough to get you judged by God, then Christianity is itself making a morally questionable claim. In other words, it is morally wrong to think that a sincere atheist would have any consequences for their unbelief because they have come to it sincerely. And that's one of the major arguments in our world today. It's a relativistic world and people just believe whatever they want to believe. And so one of the common themes in our society today is this one. It doesn't really matter what I believe. As long as my belief is sincere, whatever my religious belief is, then that's all that really matters. All that really matters is that I believe it sincerely. And the, obvi the obvious thing is there is a reaction against the word truth in our world today. There is, there are, people don't believe in something being true. The interesting thing about that, of course, is that truth emerges everywhere in the world. Because there's truth everywhere. Two plus two equals four. In every continent on, the, on, the, on our planet, two plus two equals four. Uh, in, on top of that, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. It's just true. On top of that, we know it's just true that Green Bay Packer fans have a higher IQ than Chicago Bear fans. It's just true. We know these things are true. So, right? On top of that, we judge people's truths all the time. If I came to you and said 2 plus 2 equals 4,936, you would think he's a little loony. And if I said, well, here's $2 and here's $2, now give me 4,396, you would judge my truth, right? And you would reject it. Truth just keeps merging. As a matter of fact, even the most relativistic person in our world who says, no, no, it doesn't matter what you believe, just believe it sincerely, all that matters, they are making a truth statement. Let's go back to that statement. All that matters in religion is sincere belief. Let me reword it for you. Ready? It is true that all that matters in religion is sincere belief. Do you hear that? They're making a truth claim. They're making a statement of truth. And it says, it is true that all that matters, and, and, and if you don't believe that it's a truth claim, disagree with them. And they will get mad at you, and they will fight. Because it's their truth. Truth just keeps emerging, no matter how much you want to try and deny it, pretend like it doesn't exist. Truth just, and, and people don't like truth, because truth is by nature exclusive, right? Truth, I am a man, which means I'm not a woman. Truth is exclusive. It excludes other things from being true. So if you disagree with their statement that something, that it doesn't really matter what you believe, just believe it sincerely, that all religions will get you somewhere safely, then, and you're like, no, I don't believe that, all of a sudden they're going to fight with you and they're going to be upset at you. It's almost like in every field in the, in the world we accept some, some level of truth, except when it comes to religion, because we think you can't, you can't really know what's true when it comes to religion. And on top of that, what they really get upset about is how can you say that if, you're, if you believe this is true and everything else is wrong, how can billions of people be wrong? It's like, well, billions of people are wrong all the time. We're just saying this is really important not to be wrong about. So, again, what I want to emphasize today is that there is sincerity and there's, you can be sincere and sincerely wrong, and there's a lot of people who really question that as being true. Is that really true? It's, we're in this series called Asking for a Friend, and the idea of this is I know that many of you don't have these questions. 
Many of you don't have the questions that we're going through in this series week after week, but the reality is you have friends and family and coworkers and people that you live next door to who really do ask questions like this. They want to know, does it really matter what I believe? As long as I'm sincere? And I've got lots of people in my life who ask that question. So what's the answer? What's the answer to that question? So that's what we're going to talk about. I want to ask you to open your program, take out the notes you'll find. Welcome to those of you who are watching us online, either at YouTube or at our website, penulechurch.life. These notes are right there. If you're watching on YouTube, they're in the description section. So we'd love to have you grab them and go through this, because this is really important content to begin to to process. So let's start with this. I I want to at least get you to acknowledge, wherever you're at, or or maybe this is going to be something with your friends or coworkers or family, I want you to at least acknowledge that sometimes sincerity is not enough. Sometimes it's just not enough. It's not always enough just to be sincere. And I could give you so many examples of this. Now, if you are arachnophobic and you really, really hate spiders, close your eyes for just a second, because I've got to show you this picture, right? This is a black widow spider. Some of you recognize that because you know the telltale sign on the abdomen. The, that, that hourglass look. Whenever you see that, you know you're dealing with a black widow spider. Highly toxic, can be deadly. All right, that's enough of that. Right. So did you hear the true story recently about three boys from Bolivia? Did you hear this? There were three brothers. They were out tending their family's goats. They're age 12, 10, and 8. <clears throat> All of them were bit by a black widow spider, the same one. Now, they all survived after two trips to the hospital, and they finally got the right antivenom in them. They saved their lives. So then afterwards, the parents were like, how did you get by, all of you get bit by this black widow spider? Well, it turns out they were poking the black widow spider with a stick. Not to kill it, but to rile it up. And then they intentionally put their hand up to the angry black widow spider and allowed it to bite them. All three of the boys. Do you know why? They believed that once the black widow spider had bit them, they were going to turn into Spider-Man. I'm not kidding. They sincerely believed it. And they put their money where their mouth is, so to say, right? (laughs) Well, they put their, their hand where the spider's mouth was. They believed it so much they were willing to let the black widow spider bite them because they believed that they were now going to be Spider-Man. You can be as sincere as you want and sincerely wrong, right? You can be as sincere as you want and sincerely still be wrong. Being sincere isn't enough. Sincerity doesn't cancel out truth, right? Sincerity doesn't make something true. They sincerely believe that by letting this black widow spider bite them, they're going to turn into Spider-Man. Did that make it happen? No, of course not. Sincerity doesn't cancel out truth or make something true. Instead, we have to evaluate the object of what we're believing in to make sure it's real and reliable. Will letting a black widow spider turn me into Spider-Man? I should evaluate that concept. And if you do that, you realize, no, it will make you dead. So the Bible has been saying this for hundreds of years. Sometimes what seems right is really a road to death. Sometimes they were on a road that would have killed them if not for the intervention of people who knew how to treat this thing. One of the saddest stories that proves that verse uh, is years ago there was a professional basketball player who had a day off, he was with his buddy. They got into their gun collection and they were just messing around. And his buddy knew that the gun he held in his hands was empty. There were no bullets. He knew it. And he knew it when he aimed it at his friend and knew it when he pulled the trigger and and his friend still died because the gun wasn't unloaded. And it didn't matter how sincere his belief was that the gun was, uh, was not loaded. It didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was what was true, not how sincerely you believed it. It's the, it doesn't matter how sincerely you believe it if it's not true. And over and over again, we can see this. Now, this is really, really hard for a lot of our population because they're like, you can't say that something someone else believes is not true. Because, I mean, billions of people don't believe in what we believe. You're saying that what they believe is not true? And yet, the reality is, we do this all the time. 
Again, even the most relativistic person in America is like, no, no, just believe whatever you want sincerely, just don't hurt people, right? Even they would say, what this person believes is not true. Because they believe that just because their skin color is white, they are superior to other s people of other skin colors. And they believe it sincerely, don't they? Are they right? Adamantly, no. Definitively, wrong regardless of how sincerely they believe it. Do you know that there's an entire movement of people now who think that the Nazis' extermination of six million Jews in World War II was made up? Do you know this? There are people who do not believe in the Holocaust. The millions of pictures we have, the sites that you can still tour, that are still preserved in those places, that you can still go tour, all of the pictures, all of the evidence, they think it's all made up. And they sincerely believe it. And yet we would judge their sincere belief as wrong, right? You can be sincere and sincerely wrong. And we evaluate truth statements all the time. Now, I am not saying that we shouldn't be sincere, okay? That's bad. You should be sincere. I don't want to be lied to and you shouldn't be lying either. But at the same time, it's more important to be sincere and right. That's really important. It's not enough to just be sincere. You have to be sincere and right. The object of what you're believing in needs to be reliable. And my mom has a huge sense of humor. I don't talk about my mom's sense of humor very often, I should. When I was a little boy, I remember one time, uh, my mom and I were somewhere, and I, I was praying, and I folded my hands to pray. And, and I started praying, and when I was done, mom said, Brian, don't pray like that, with your hands folded like this. She said, otherwise, the devil can get in the cracks. She said, only pray like this. Now, I want you to do this. Would you fold your hands, just even watching, I'll just fold your hands like this, okay? So she said, don't pray like this, because the devil can get in the cracks. Now, fold your hands like this, and you tell me which one has more cracks. Right? As a boy, I was so confused. For years, I prayed like this in my confusion. Finally, years later, I went to mom and said, Mom, you've got to explain this to me. This has so many more cracks in it than this. The devil can get in. She burst into laughter. She didn't even remember telling me that. She had just been being silly with me one day, and it's like, oh, I believed you for years. And what I believed was wrong. You can be sincere and sincerely believe it, and it's not even true. All of us have stories like that in our life, maybe not that one, but I want you to acknowledge that sometimes sincerity is not enough. What we're trusting in, the object of our belief, has to be reliable. So that brings me to the second point of this. So then we have to actually start to put religious truth claims to the test, because every religion makes truth claims, every single one. Even atheists make truth claims, people who say they have no faith, they make truth claims. They, they make the claim that there is no God. And we have to evaluate these truth claims of the major world religions. There was a, because again, sometimes what we're believing isn't true. So there's a woman who was, you know, ever tried to get the bottom, the ketchup out of the bottom of, of the ketchup jar, the old glass ones? You know what to do. You pound and pound and pound till it kind of pops out at the bottom. And so one day this mom was doing this for her, her little four-year-old daughter and the phone rang and so the, the girl went to get the house phone and she answered it and said, and it was the pastor of the church. And the little girl said, mom can't come to the phone right now, she's hitting the bottle. Okay, now that pastor might probably believe something about mom that's not true. But it's noon and she's hitting the bottle already, might have to have a little intervention here. But the reality was it wasn't true. Evaluate the objects of what you believe to see if they are true. That's what I'm saying. And here's the thing, again, I want to emphasize this again. It doesn't matter how sincerely Christians believe in Jesus. It doesn't matter how sincerely Hindus believe in their millions of God. It doesn't matter how sincerely Muslims believe in, their, uh, in Muhammad. It doesn't matter how sincerely they believe, because you can be sincere and wrong. You can be sincere and wrong. And you can be sincere, and if what you believe isn't true, it can do great harm, right? It could do great harm. So you've got to evaluate it. So the first thing, again, on your notes, letter A, is you have to accept the concept of truth. At least consider the idea that truth may exist. 
In our world, that's really hard for people to get. Because again, so many people when it comes to religion say this, right? There is no such thing as truth that applies to all people. This is so common in our society today. There's no such thing as religious truth that applies to all people. Uh, matter of fact, some people even take it further and say there is no such thing as truth that applies to all people, which is of course ridiculous. Take those people at the top of the tallest building and shove them off, and whether they believe in the force of gravity or not, they will experience it, right? Because it exists and affects all people. You don't have to believe in gravity for it to affect you. And just because some things in our world are unclear, like COVID right now, what's the truth? Does anyone know the truth? This is insane. Well, nobody knows the truth. And so in the world like this, where there's so many times, and we've had this in our history, right? Who shot JFK? We don't know. Somebody knows. There are a million theories, and only one of them is true, right? And because we live in a world like this where there's so much uncertainty, sometimes we project that out. Well, then nothing's certain. Well, that's not true. There are certainly things that are certain. Everyone needs water or you will die. That is simply true. That's simply true. And people who really struggle with this concept of truth, they have a problem because let's go back to their statement. This is so common again. There's no such thing as truth that applies to all people. Let me reword it for you so you can hear how they have a problem. The truth is, there's no such thing as truth that applies to all people. Do you hear the problem logically? Even their relativistic statement that says there's no such thing as truth that applies to all people is a truth statement. They're invalidating their own argument. They're, they're saying there's no such thing as truth, and that's the truth. <laughs> it just, truth just emerges, whether you want to believe it or not. Jesus didn't hide from the fact that there is truth that you can know. Look at what he said. You can actually know the truth. Jesus wasn't uncertain about this. He said there is truth, you can know the truth, and if you get to know the truth, the truth will change your whole life. Jesus didn't hide from the concept of truth. There is a truth that you can know, and that truth will set you free. So that brings us then, once if we accept the fact that, okay, maybe there is truth in this world, then you have to examine the religious truth claims of these different religions. What do they make? Examine the truth claims. And this should be part of our, our filter. One of my new favorite stories, if you are truly a history nut, I'll be totally impressed if you know this story, but this is from our American history. You ever heard of Jemima Wilkinson? Jemima Wilkinson, born in 1752, part of the, the birth of our nation. She had an experience where she said God came to her and she died and God brought her back to life and then told her that she was special and that she would never die. As a matter of fact, after she died again, she was going to rise from the dead, just like Jesus did. So she had 200 ardent followers who listened to everything she said. They followed her and believed her. As a matter of fact, this is how much they believed her. One day, she took them down to the lake, and she said, I'm going to walk on water like Jesus did. And she said, do you all believe I can do that? And they're like, yeah. And she said, well, then there's no need for me to do it. And she walked away. <laughs> they believed her. They kept believing. She had very special instructions for the day that she died because she was going to rise again. So you couldn't put her in a coffin, bury her in the ground. So they were supposed to preserve her body, put it up on this place. And, and then she, the day came and she died. And nobody's heard of her. You know why? Because her body decomposed. They buried her finally and realized, oops. It wasn't reliable for us to believe in this woman. She wasn't telling the, the truth. Or she was a little bit crazy. One or the other is now true and we see that. Isn't that a great story from our history? Jemima Wilkinson. Now you just learned something amazing about our country. You need to examine them. The Bible says this, the gullible believe anything they're told. <laughs> it's the prudent that sift and weigh every word. This is what Christianity, Christianity really wants you to engage with your mind. Now, one of the reasons people don't do this when it comes to religion is because there are common misconceptions out there about religion. And here's one of them, and you hear this all the time too. All religions are basically the same, with only superficial differences. And you ever heard the elephant illustration? The elephant illustration is that all the world religions are basically touching a different part of the elephant. 
and describe him. It's like God is like the elephant and the, the Christians are holding on to the tail and they're touching the tail and describing the tail and, and they're like, this is what God is like. But the Muslims, they're touching the front right hoof and they're like, no, no, this is what God's like. And the Hindus are touching the, the, the trunk and they're describing and saying, no, this is what it's like, but it's all the same elephant. And all the world religions basically are the same with only superficial differences and nothing could be further from the truth. The reality is all the major world religions are fundamentally different with only superficial similarities. They're fundamentally different. There are world religions like Hindus that believe in millions of gods. Millions of gods. And then there are Muslims who say, oh no, there's only one. There are Buddhists who say there is no God. So they can't all be right because truth and all major religions, not just Christianity, all religions make truth claims. Muslims, there is one God. Hindus, there are millions of gods. Right? And Buddhists, there is no God. They can't all be right. There can't be no God, one God, millions of God, and all these world religions. They are fundamentally different. They're all making truth claims, and it's our job to make sure that we evaluate to see what we actually believe. We have to evaluate the truth claims. So how do you do that? Well, flip your notes over in the back. I got this resource from you, and I wanted to just, I'm not going through all of that content, but I absolutely love this stuff. There are five questions you can ask to tr you evaluate what you believe. But see at the bottom, origin, meaning, morality, and destiny, this is what I really want you to think about. These four questions are the four questions you need to use to evaluate any worldview. For instance, I'm, I'm obviously, I talk about all four of those here in Christianity, but let me run through them quickly with atheism. The worldview that there is no God. So it has to answer the question of origin. Where do I come from? Well, atheists say there was a big bang and the universe exploded and eventually, billions of years later, you. So there was nothing, then there was something, it exploded and turned into you. That's the origin. When you ask them where that stuff came from or what caused the explosion, they have no origin answer, right? They don't know. One of the theories that is just amazing to me that they present is the theory of the multiverse, that there are an infinite number of universes. That's the only way they can deal with the math because the mathematical possibility that life exists in the universe is so ridiculously impossible to believe but they have to come up with this idea that there's a universe-making machine that's just spitting out universes, and eventually, if you create an infinite number of universes, life will exist in one of them. Well, that, then the question is, well, where'd the universe-making machine come from? It can't answer the origin of life. Atheism, meaning, what's meaning? What, what does life really mean if you're an atheist in that worldview? Oh, it's meaningless. You're, you're, just a, you're just a nicer dressed monkey that doesn't swing in the trees anymore. There's no meaning. Make up your own meaning. What about morality? How do I define good and evil? There's no definition for good and evil. How, what basis do you have for saying that anyone else's belief is evil or their actions are evil in an atheistic worldview? There's no basis for that. You can appeal to society good. Well, what if society like World War II, uh, Nazi society defines that slaughtering people is good? On what basis do you say that was evil? Their society determined that it was fine. Do you see the problem with this? And what about destiny? What happens when I die? What, what, what's the worldview of an atheist say? What happens when you die? Well, it's just over. You're put in the ground and worms eat you and you are soon forgotten and nothing you've ever done matters. That's why atheism you know, statistically usually stays around 10% because it's really hard to grasp that that could be true, right? It doesn't answer any of the major questions of life. So then you, you filter through Christianity through those questions. And there are answers, and that's what I love about it. I love about Christianity. Christianity encourages critical questions because it claims to be based on objective truth. Facts. That's why we talk about archaeology. That's why we talk about science. That's why we quote math. Because there's basis for believing in our God. There's, there's literal history and facts and math and science that you can point to that points, that gives you evidence that says your faith is rational. So again, some of you, it's like, well, I may have some questions about this. Great. Christianity encourages questions. You go right ahead and ask any question you have. Matter of fact, we have resources that we're giving away back on the back table. If you're watching online, just write us. We will gladly give you books, but you don't, 
you can all just go to this website, rzim.org, and we say it over and over again in this series, you can research for yourself. You can go on YouTube. Some of you are watching on YouTube, hit pause and go type in Ravi Zacharias plus university. And you can watch him debate in public universities where he opens up the mic and lets any college student ask any question and it's amazing. Because our faith is based on evidence and rational thought. And some of you, you need some more questions answered. You need to examine your own worldview. What do you believe? What about the religious truths that you believe in? The Bible says don't just believe them, really examine them so you know what you believe. All right, but then here's the big thing. What all of this comes down to is, is responding to Jesus' truth claims. Respond to his truth claims. So, some of you know the name Jane Fonda. Years ago, she was on a TV show called The Dick Cavett Show. And she was on there with the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, the Archbishop, in the middle of the interview, said, well, Jesus is the Son of God. And Jane Fonda responded this way, well, maybe he is for you, but he's not for me. And the Archbishop correctly said, well, either he is or he isn't. And of course, her view sounds so tolerant, so open-minded. And this is our country right now. It's been around for, as you can see, decades. It's like, this seems so tolerant. Well, Jesus is for you. He's God the Son, the Son of God for you, but he's not for me. It doesn't even make sense to say that. For instance, I, I am the son of Clint. It's not that I'm the son of Clint to my mom and my brother and sister, but not to you. I just am. It's simply a truth claim. That's all it is. It sounds tolerant to believe what she says, but it's not even an option. Jesus didn't let it be an option. Jesus didn't give people the option. He was trying to force the decision. Do you know what Jesus said? Look at this. Jesus in the Bible claimed to be God. He took the titles of God, claimed to have the powers of God, including the power to forgive sins. He claimed to have come from God, claimed to be the son of God, claimed to be the only way to God. These are just some of the claims that Jesus made. And then he said to his disciples at one point, the same question he asks of every human being on earth, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? He wasn't just letting us just listen to this or his population, the, his, his crowd listen to this without trying to come to a decision. Who do you say I am? You have to make a decision about what you believe about what I'm saying. Some of you, again, may not be as familiar with the claims of Jesus and what he said. Let me show you just a few of these things because look how direct he was. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, some of you don't know your, the first part of your Bible or may not be familiar with that phrase, I am. In the Old Testament, God sent Moses back into the, to, uh, to the Pharaoh to say, let my people go. He used Moses to deliver the nation of Israel from slavery in Egypt. When Moses was like, hey, if I go back and tell the Israelites to follow me, who should I say sent me? And God said, tell them, I am sent you. Because it was a description of his eternity. I am. I just always have been. I am God. He doesn't exist in the world of nature. He's beyond it. He created it. So he said, tell them I am sent you. So when Jesus said this to the Jews, two things. He said, first off, before Abraham was born, I've been alive, which of course, he was 30 years old. There's no way that could be. Abraham had been dead for hundreds and hundreds of years. But then to take the title of God, I am. They picked up stones to stone him to death. Because here was a mere man saying, I am. Saying, I'm God. If I stood here in front of all of you and said, listen, you all know me as Brian, but the reality is, I'm God. Right? Hmm. You're going to have to evaluate that truth claim. Most of you, in a moment, are going to say, he's crazy, he's lost it, because I'm not God but I'm claiming to be. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Do you know what they did right after he said that? They picked up stones to stone him in this time too. Because how can you claim to be God? You're claiming equality with God when you make this statement. It's like, whoa. Jesus said, whoever believes in the Son is eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son, you will never have eternal life. You won't even see it. And the reason is because God's wrath remains on him. It's like, whoa, talk about an exclusive claim. You won't even get to eternity without me. 
I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be. You will indeed die in your sins. Whoa. Matter of fact, in the one that really riles people up and gets people really mad at Christians, and again, I haven't written any of these verses, right? All of you acknowledge, I just am quoting what Jesus said. I didn't write them. Jesus said these things, and all of them designed to make us respond. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I mean, that is a pretty incredible truth statement. If I stood here and said to all of you today, you can never get to God, you will never get to heaven unless you come through me. I'm just going to generate some anger in some of you. Some of you are going to walk out, you're done with me, right? Because who am I to say that? And that's what Jesus said. And he was going for that reaction. Who am I? That's what he's after. Who do you say he is? Because these are the truth, somewhat, just a few of the truth claims of Jesus. He claims some very specific things. And you got to make up your mind about who you say he is. So who do you say he is? Most people have a really hard time saying that Jesus was a kook. That he was just insane. They have a really hard time saying that Jesus was evil. Because if I stood here and said, I am the only one who can forgive your sins, like Jesus said, whoa. I mean, you're going to think I'm either insane or I have some very malicious, evil purpose, right? You're not going to think good about me. But people have a hard time saying that about Jesus because he was such a great moral teacher. And so that's what they say. He was just a great moral teacher. He was a good human being. He was a great leader. On and on they say, C.S. Lewis had it right. And this is what I want you to hear me say. Jesus, uh, C.S. Lewis said, I'm trying to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. They say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. He said, that is the only thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He's either a lunatic, you know, on a level with a man who says, I'm a poached egg. (laughs) Okay, you're cuckoo. Right? That's what he would be. Or he's the devil of hell. C.S. Lewis said, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or he's a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that option open to us. He did not intend to. You have to respond to the truth claims of Jesus. Who do you say he is? Now some of you, listening to this today, you have more questions than when you walked in here. Great. Christianity doesn't fear your questions. That's why we get resources like this. We put them on the back table. And again, if you're watching online, just write us at the church. Go to our website at penielchurch.life and write us in the Connect section. We'll send you books and resources. We'll do what we can to help. But you can simply go today to that r- website, rzim.org. And you can start listening today and get your own questions answered. What if truth is real? What if there is something that's really true, which means other things are not true? like in every area of our lives. And what if what Jesus said is true? You've got to make your own mind up. You've got to start doing some reading. You've got to watch something. You can listen. I had someone write me this just this morning and say, hey, where do I go if I want to listen to some of these podcasts? Because you can listen to these on your phone. You go to the Play Store and download a podcast tool, and then you can listen to RZIM on your phone, and you can get questions answered. And you can see that your faith is based on something. And part of why I'm doing this is for those of you who say you follow Jesus. Because many of the people who are watching or here, you, you believe in Jesus. That's why you're here. You're already convinced, and what I want you to know is that your faith is built on a solid foundation. There is tremendous evidence that points to the fact that Jesus is who he said he was. There's a reason you never heard of that woman, I already forgot her name, Jemima Wilkinson. There's a reason you never heard from her. You know what happens to world religions when the leader says, I'm going to rise from the dead three days later, and they don't? They die, they're gone. You've never heard of her because it's this crazy little footnote in history. 
If Jesus died and didn't rise again, there is no Christianity. There's none. Because this has already happened in our history as a, on the planet. Something changed those, those disciples into people who were willing to be slaughtered for their faith and not back down. And it was because they were convinced that Jesus rose again. That he was alive. And our faith is based on evidence. For some of you who follow Jesus, here's my challenge to you. I really want to challenge you this week to spend time reading in one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Those are the books of the Bible that record the life of Jesus. For some of you, it's been a while since you read what Jesus said. And this is a great time to reinforce your faith. Go back to one of those four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. I like John. I'd start in that one. And just read. And let the words of Jesus enter into your mind. See how specific he was about claiming to be someone very specific and let your faith be re reinforced by that. Some of you are exploring your faith and you, don't, you are not ready to sign on the dotted line. And that is wonderful that you're watching or here with us today. There was a verse in there that we went past. It's on your notes. Jesus said this, and I need to explain it to you. Jesus said, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life. And here's why. God's wrath remains on him. One of the verses that I, I bet most pastors skip regularly. Because do you really want to think of God as angry? Do you like the concept of a... God that has wrath and anger, we don't like that. We only want our God to be a smiling God. But here's my question to you. Are you angry at some of the things that are happening in our nation today? Are you angry? It's okay. It's not a bad thing to say you're angry. You get angry when injustice happens, right? But it's not okay for God to have that same feeling? He created us in his image. You honestly think he doesn't get angry at some of the injustices in our world, but it's okay for you to get angry? We're created in his image. He gets mad. There are things that really hurt his heart. Every human created in his image is loved by him, and when, we hurt, when anyone hurts one of his creations, it hurts him and makes him mad. And here's the thing we don't think about. We think about people who are hurting others in our world, and we do not spend any time thinking about how much pain we have brought into this world. The highest virtue in life is love, right? Nothing higher. It is the greatest thing. God is love, the Bible teaches. And every time you and I act in a way or th it, that is contrary to love, we bring damage into the world. Can you even think of how many times you've been unloving? So well, it's easy for us to point a finger at all these people out there and super hard to think, well, what have I done? How have I contributed to this mess? And if, God, if it's okay for God to get mad at those people for what they're doing to hurt others, but it's not okay for him to be mad at me for what I've done that has hurts, hurts others, do you see the inconsistency of your thinking here? That's what Jesus meant when he said his wrath remains on us. We have done things that hurt other human beings all our lives. And in hurting them, we hurt God. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus came to save us from the unloving things we've brought into the world. When Jesus died on the cross, he took into his body all that we've done that's wrong. Paid for it all in full completely. The perfect Son of God gave his life for us and then rose from the dead three days later. So any person who simply hears the message of what Jesus has done and says, Jesus, I believe in you, at the moment they believe, they are completely forgiven. The debt was paid by him. And there is no wrath anymore. The wrath was put on his son Jesus. So either you take it or you let Jesus take it. Let me have you bow your heads. Ultimately, this is the decision you have to make, is who do you say Jesus was? I have made my choice. I made my choice when I was 14 years old, 
having heard the message I just told you about Jesus giving his life on a cross for us. And at the moment I made my decision, he began the process of changing me. He is a real God and you can know him. And you don't have to have all your doubts answered. You can move with the smallest amount of faith if it makes sense to you. And you want Jesus' gift, here's what you say with your head bowed. You say, Jesus, I can't even think about the number of times I've been unloving in this world. I cannot even think about it. And it never dawned on me that you would be mad about those things. But Jesus, I've heard that you died on the cross for me. And you paid my debt so that I could be forgiven based on what you've done. So today, I'm putting my trust in you. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Begin a new relationship with me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we finish up here today, I want to ask you to grab your, pro your program, take the little connection card out. And if you're online, you can just go to our website at Connect in the Connect tab and check this. Let us know if you've made this decision today. Maybe you just prayed and asked Jesus to forgive you. Check this box or you renewed your commitment. Just let us know right here. For if you're here, you can just drop it in the offering box. If you're watching online, go to our website at Connect um, and the Connect tab on penielchurch.life and let us know that way. And we will send you some follow-up stuff. If you want the books that we talked about, we will send you the books. Just let us know for free, no cost. We're glad to help you explore your own faith and answer your questions. So thanks so much for coming. We hope to see you again next week.